Fine Arts at university and did a lot of printmaking and painting and drawing. And really, I've been doing, uh, I've been lucky enough to, to uh, uh, I've been doing art ever since school. And I basically supported myself doing um, other kinds of work. And I, I did so-called uh, uh, good jobs for about five years, and they were not good, nothing good about them. And so what I did was I, I went back to being a waitress. So I waitressed part-time and did that for over 25 years. And the four days a week that I was on my own, I did my work. So I was able to make enough of a living that I didn't have to sell my work. So that liberated me from doing what was just easy. And uh, I did a lot of, uh, so I did lithography and etching, and uh, then I started doing monotypes. And I started using very, very large pieces of Western paper, meaning Western like arch paper. And I started to integrate little bits of Japanese paper. And then I started to say, oh, these papers are very interesting on their own. So gradually I started to work directly onto the Japanese papers. Um, often doing things that mimicked calligraphy, uh, uh, lots, of ex lots of experimental things. Um, I went through, but I would say I spent a good 10 years do doing monotypes and uh, collagraphs where I used actual plant matter and would build up my plates and would do these sandwiches of Western paper, Japanese paper, uh, plant matter and then something else would go on and then the, the blankets go on and then it, you crank it through the, the press and so what I did was I would cut uh, brand new fresh stuff so that I wanted some bleed actually coming from the plants so they, the bleed would actually tint, tint the papers so I did that for a while and then um, I found working in printmaking studios started to become toxic because I was breathing in all the chemicals from all the other departments. So I basically had to stop. It was, I would be there for an hour and I would feel unwell. So I just started to work directly onto the papers. And now I can get my, my impressions by using rollers or other methods of, of pressing without having to actually use a, a press. Um, and uh, I've been exploring different kinds of paper in painting. This particular one here is an inexpensive paper used for Japanese doors. It comes on in seven meter rolls and I will paint them on the, fl on the ground. So the one in the window is a one-third of a 21, sorry, 63 foot installation that normally hangs above and you walk under. So I started to experiment using, you know, very, very large pieces of paper and doing pores. And again, a lot of it was experimenting with the uh, pigments and to see how far can I stretch this, you know, and I'm trying to use like really good, really good uh, pigments, you know, how much water, how much uh, uh, medium can I put in and still get some kind of color happening, you know. Um, and then, you know, I also worked small. I also. I keep all of my little pieces of paper, so I'll, I'll work small. This particular back paper is, um, it's a handmade paper, Japanese paper, and it's tinted with um, pomegranate, just a second. I've forgotten. Anyway, it, it's, it's a natural dye, and all of these other pieces are, are called from my big library of papers, and, and again, with the exception of this orangey, orangey one that I cannot make myself, impossible, because it's transparent and very, very strong. The, the Japanese papers are made from three fibers, kozo or mulberry, gampi and mizumata, and these are uh, sustainable crops that can only, well, I won't say only be grown in Japan, but principally, because they're grown at a certain height on a mountain with a certain water source and can only be harvested in winter. The, the actual making of the paper is brutal. It's not a, it's not a glamorous uh, occupation, but the results, there are thousands of kinds of these papers and they all have a different behavior. They're like people. 
and when you meet it, you have to treat it with respect, and then you try to do something when you say, okay, can I, can I do this with this? So a lot of the work that I do now is really, um, because I work a quite a long time with one paper, just so I can become acquainted with it before I introduce new ones. But when I find a new paper, it's like, oh, goody, a new paper. So I will try old methods, meaning my own methods on it, just to see, okay, how far can I take this paper? What will it do on its own? And I try to, um, you know, to really watch the kind of result to see, okay, you know, how can I best uh, have this paper respond? How, how can it give me what it's supposed to give me as opposed to me trying to impose too much my idea of what to do with it, you know? Does that explain a little bit? Yeah. So I, I've been working since, uh, you know, I, I just did an undergrad degree. I did a four-year degree. So that, I guess that was in 78. I did, f I did three years in 1973 before you were born. And went back, you know, stayed out for five years, went to Europe and did all those things. And as I said, tried these so-called good jobs that weren't good. And then went back and did a fourth year thinking that I would do grad school. I didn't actually do grad school. I decided I was just going to do art. And so since 78, I've been pretty much doing art and supporting it. And then about maybe a little less, maybe 15 years ago, I started to teach because I thought, well, now I actually have something to offer. So I complement my art making by teaching, and that's how I make my living, between the two things. And uh, what I teach is, uh, I, I often use a contemplative approach to painting and drawing, which means that I integrate an actual meditation practice. So these are things I do myself, both yoga and meditation. And I find that it helps the student relax, which is the most important thing. And when they're relaxed, they can actually listen. And when they listen, they can hear. It makes it much easier to teach. Everyone is quiet, you know. So from just strictly from a teaching standpoint, it's also very good. And sometimes what happens is a kind of energy will build up in, in the class and in people's work, where, and they start to become confused. And sometimes what happens is, is, is the student becomes irrational and impulsive, and they will do something that they didn't really mean to do. And in fact, what they needed to do was to stop and to sit down and look out the window and just, just relax a bit and then come back and look at it and say, oh, okay, maybe if I do this. So in the last number of years, I, st I have started to bring those three things together. So hatha yoga, seated meditation, and art making. So I will offer those usually in a retreat situation. And that way, people get to relate to their whole selves before they start to make a mark and to do something. Do you just study um, with different teachers? So I study uh, Japanese uh, flower arranging. My teacher is 92 years old, and she just told me she's probably going to, to move to Victoria, so I am overjoyed. She is a master teacher. She's a wonder to be around, so I'm very, very happy. Once I'm established here, I will I will get back to actually studying Japanese calligraphy. I, there's many things I've had to put aside just in order to kind of land. You know? So, so I, I continue to study. You know, I, I consider myself to be a, a student as well, not just a teacher. So, and I find that the teaching, um, as long as I don't do too much, always shows me something new. Brand new student does something, and I go, Oh, look at that. Oh, isn't that interesting? So to me, very much a sense of exchange, you know, as opposed to me being somehow the expert. And, you know, I have, for sure, I have more experience. But, you know, a lot of what I do depends on allowing the unexpected to happen and then to examine it. I'm looking and say, oh, look at that. Gee, now how can I do that again? How can I now do that on purpose? What happened accidentally? Can we then... Um, do it more than one time. So that's a bit, you know, my approach. Some of these paintings have actually taken a long time to do because I've done one or two layers and I, I get stuck. I don't know what to do, so I leave it and I put it away, sometimes for years. And then I pull it out again and then I do my next layer and I go, mm, still not sure what I'm trying to do here. Put it away again. But at a certain point I go, okay, you know, really, it's time. Let's, let's, let's finish this off. 
So um, there's actually there there is a little bit like they're kind of skins of information and different time periods. So if I actually look at some of the paintings, I can remember, you know, where they started, what was going on at that time, and th this is all background information. You know, the the person looking at it doesn't necessarily get that, but I can remember, and, and including including the the top pieces, the the washi pieces. I go, oh yeah, that was when I did the Im you know the impressions of of the leaves at this place, and then I put the paper aside and then I waited and then I did another layer of acrylic wash on and then I put this and that together. So, so there's a kind of, a, in, a, in a sense, kind of a mapping that happens with these pieces as well. You know. And then there's some that come together very quickly. You know, I don't think about it too much and they just, everything lines up. And, okay, that's it. The piece is done. You know. So sometimes I, I, I work on the size of business card because that's the energy is asking for something very, very small and something that can be completed, you know, 10 strokes, you know. And there's other things that have taken a much longer period of time. So the name of the show is Utsuru uh, in Japanese, which means shift. And the works are a combination of various Japanese papers and canvas. And... Uh, the theme of the show really has come about because I'm, I feel as if I'm constantly in transition. But in particular, I've made a big move from the East Coast to the West Coast. And uh, so the work is reflecting uh, some of the aspects of the idea of constantly being in movement or transition. So some of the pieces in particular, in terms of their imagery, make reference to uh, natural phenomenon. Water, rock, uh, what happens when water gets caught into rock and freezes. So there are uh, little clues in terms of even though the rock is not a painted rock, there's not an actual rock, um, often making uh, reference to uh, elements of nature. So in many of the pieces, uh, they're either called together. So for instance, a piece in front of us here, uh, there is a, uh, a stroke that crosses over on top of a number of papers. So things are, are done in layers. And uh, the, the papers come white, with the exception of this orange one. But everything comes white and has been hand painted. Or in this case, this is a part of an aqua tint, an old aqua tint. Uh, from printmaking. Uh, all the different papers are different qualities, different types, different weights, and then they are put together, and sometimes they are then drawn over top, and then sometimes they're layered physically one on top of the other. So to give this idea and this sense of always there's, there's a kind of shifting or movement implied. S sometimes the movement is actual because the piece is meant to not be framed, so to be hung uh, by dowels or by rare earth magnets so that the actual, we actually want air current to be a part of the actual piece. Um, in other uh, cases, uh, the piece, the movement is implicit because the Japanese paper has been painted on separately than the canvas. So the canvas has been, uh, maybe there's a number of, of uh, layers that have been put on and then, then the Japanese papers are glued onto the canvas and then other papers on top, and then the movement is, is implicit in terms of the actual gesture of the stroke. Sometimes there's, uh, so for instance here, these areas of white and in, in the uh, pieces in the window, the areas of the white have been stopped out by hot beeswax, so the first gestures that go down really are about movement. And then the, the rest of the painting is done, and there are certain areas here, again, as I said, they, they kind of mimic uh, certain natural phenomenon, which is that I put pigment, strong areas of pigment, lots of water, sometimes I, I put them on plastic so that uh, I wait for a drying time to happen. So I do not over-manipulate myself. In other words, I let the pigments 
and the water and the, all the different papers behave differently. I let them do their thing. And what happens is it, it, they give me things that I could not possibly paint myself. I could, I could not create the kind of, kind of crazing that happens because it's, it's really a, a matter of pulling all those things together at once. And uh, if we come over to look at this one in particular, so this one and this one too where there's been layers of pigment, and then the, the last one, because there's so much water in it, the pigment, and because it's metallic, there's a lot of metallic, metallic sits on the surface, so you get this kind of crazing that happens that gives the kind of sense of texture. So movement is either implicit or explicit, and then sometimes the gesture, I will leave it. Sometimes I want it to be graded, so then I'll add a little bit of water and then you see here all this pooling, same thing. I couldn't do that, okay? And it's, it's really the kind of chemical and alchemical uh, mix that happens. And I have to sit there and I have to, thank you for coming. I, ha I have to sit there and just kind of watch it. And, you know, obviously I help it along a little bit, you know. But um, there's really a lot of um, waiting for things to happen and saying, okay, what's going to happen? If, do I tilt this a little bit? Do I add a little bit more water? Do I let it dry before I add more pigment? And so very, very, very much about yeah. the material quality of what's going to happen with this. In this one here, this layer here, I've added um, pumice into the paint so that it gives this pitted granular quality. So again, trying to kind of mimic a sense of, you know, rock or you know, rock water interference with some other kind of element you know uh